I'm an MB gal in a Barbie ma mal. It feels fantastic. Hey, hey, where is everybody? Okay, yes, I know I missed the Barbie dream boat and this essay is way beyond topical. One of the most ironic things that I've learned about making your own movie is that while you're making it, you have less time to go and see other movies. Oh yeah, by the way, I filmed a sci-fi movie starring folks like John Delancey and Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube coming out on Nebula early next year. So subscribe to see when it releases. But regardless, this I think led to my unique experience with the Barbie movie, as it quickly became this phenomenon that not only dominated at the box office in a year that didn't have much box office going on, I understand that these events can be psychologically scarring, but seemed to be an earnestly significant moment for women in cinema. I love the diversity, I love the concept about life and death, and then like what is it like in the real world and woman empowerment. I legit had members of my family, mostly women, who rarely discuss movies beyond casual conversations about MCU characters at Christmas actually choking up while talking about Barbie. It was this collective celebratory moment that I've never really seen in mainstream film before, at least in terms of women generally feeling so passionate and positive. And this was even more surreal to me considering I had little context for it outside of seeing Ken's amazing t-shirts. So between sleepless nights putting together shot lists and getting to direct freaking Q, I did manage to watch Barbie on digital. And I was shocked that I came out of it feeling uncomfortable in a way that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot I quickly loved about Barbie. I mean, just visually it's a triumph. The production destroyed the pink paint industry alone to deliver some of the most distinctive looking sets and imagery this decade, even more so when it's contrasted with its bland fix it in post with overworked VFX houses, blockbuster peers like MCU movies. Speaking of, unlike most blockbusters that cobble together the story in the editing bay and reshoots, director Greta Gerwig managed to bring her voice to Barbie in a way few indie filmmakers can do in blockbuster film, delivering a movie that has a clear vision. And I could also see why, what with things like America Ferreira's fantastic monologue about the contradicting pressures of womanhood, why Barbie had resonated so deeply. Never be selfish, never fall down, never fail, never show fear, never get out of line. So at first, I thought my dislike for the film was probably because it was overhyped, or that as someone who has been reading Bell Hooks for years, that it was too entry-level feminism for me to really get into it. But the more that I thought about it, the more I found the film insidious. And I swear, my criticism is gonna be more than me saying film bad because capitalism selling Barbie product. Or at least it's slightly more complex than that. And the clue that finally helped me articulate what my problem was came from the fact of how much Barbie references one of my favorite films of all time. The Matrix. Oh, you thought you were gonna go a whole video without me referencing The Matrix? You fools! This is a transgender channel after all. You have fallen into my trap. Oh, maybe that's a poor choice of words given the trans context. Um, you have all fallen into my gender agenda. Fuck. You are about to enter into my neo... ...vagina. Barbie references The Matrix a lot. Obviously, it does so in very overt ways, with weird Barbie offering white, <coughs> excuse me, stereotypical Barbie, a shoe version of the red and blue pill, or Barbie meeting the Oracle, aka Barbie's creator, Ruth Handler. But even more subtly, Barbie is structured much like The Matrix and its subsequent sequels. And yet, ultimately, Barbie shies away from the same revolutionary statements of those films. Despite both works using gender, either textually or allegorically, to overtly criticize systems of hierarchical power and having central protagonists who become stand-ins for the exploitation of our identities, both films reach vastly different conclusions. So for Barbie to repurpose the Matrix in ways both overt and subtle to wildly different ends feels like a fundamental misunderstanding of the radical nature of the Matrix, and ultimately, for me, underscores Barbie's central failings at truly grappling with a basic feminist framework that falls short of comprehending the intersecting systems of power that gender finds itself at a critical cross-gap between. I know I'm an idiot, but I did not realize how putting on these sunglasses would make the teleprompter so frickin' difficult to read. 
Despite Barbie featuring more overt references to dissident identities than The Matrix itself does, what with Weird Barbie, a transgender Barbie, and my amazing boy Alan, it doesn't dissect how those aspects conflict with the movie's binary grasps of society that fails to account for a racial critique of gender that the movie actively invites and in many ways requires to have a consequential message. So beyond just being able to show off my midriff, I wanted to talk about it with all of you. So let's discuss how Barbie sissified the Matrix. N no, no, not, not like that. I mean, I'm not here to kink shame anyone, but we, we've all looked at sissification erotica. I meant cis, like C-I-S, cis, sissify, just, just roll the intro. But before we get started, I want to briefly talk about media bias. Throughout this video, we're going to talk about the right-wing media's reaction to movies like Barbie and how discussions about the film were filtered through a culture war lens. And while I know many of you in my audience can easily spot a Ben Shapiro or Matt Walsh type ranting about woke Hollywood media, and um, and um, I have I have thoughts. Oh, that's good for you, baby. The reason culture war conversations become so dangerous is because they then get filtered through an increasingly partisan news media system that frames every issue in a binary way that devolves the conversation into an us versus them dichotomy that centers around the most incendiary topic. They just gave Barbie the Bud Light treatment, which probably looks pretty stupid in retrospect. And that's where today's sponsor, Ground News, comes in. Ground News is a platform that makes it easy to compare news sources and read between the lines of media bias to break free from algorithms. Ground News has a ton of useful tools to help grow your media literacy skills surrounding news stories. It has a rating system that adds context to every news story, allowing you to identify an outlet's media bias and check the source's credibility. Information that is generated by independent news monitoring organizations like Media Bias Fact Checkers, as well as allowing you to view ownership data for news outlets researched by Ground News itself. And Ground News is available everywhere that you would need it, both on your web browser as an extension and your Android and iOS. And right now, for Black Friday, they are having their biggest sale of the year, a 40% off sale for their Vantage subscription that ends on November 30th. The Vantage subscription includes unlimited access to all Ground News features, like their app, website, and newsletters, for only $5 a month. So if you want to grab an incredibly useful tool for fighting back in our increasingly disinformation-filled media landscape for the cheapest it can be, as well as help support me at the same time, use the link on screen or in the description to subscribe to Ground News. But with that said, let's get back to our Barbie world. To understand how Barbie deviates from the Matrix, we first need to know how Barbie presents its world. Barbie Land is a society run by Barbies in a universe made of the collective unconscience of real-world girls who play with Barbies. A place where their dolls have immortal, perfect lives that run on endless loops, the same day, every day. And the film points out that each of these different Barbies are equally Barbie. Their status as Barbie is precisely the same, and the world of Barbie Land supposedly has equal rights. However, we learn that this world is ultimately a product of the in-universe Mattel, the company that makes Barbie toys. Thus, Barbie Land is an artificial universe that uses the Barbies as a commodity. And this echoes the Matrix in very overt ways, with the titular Matrix being an artificial system created to use its human residents for labor and battery power. Both movies use these manufactured realities to point to a corporatized system that exploits one's existence. In Barbie, though, there is an essential distinction between the Barbies that the film makes subtly. The film centers on Margot Robbie's Barbie, who the narrator states is just one of the Barbies. And here is one of those Barbies now, living her best day every day. Visually, though, the film opens by showing us the origins of Barbie in an ode to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, which showcases Margot Robbie's Barbie as the original Barbie, upon which all the other Barbies are just deviations of. 
And these deviations come in a couple of different ways. While they are all women, they are also racially diverse. The film never draws attention to this racial diversity or presents it as something that distinguishes the Barbies in any way. Similarly, there are other superficial differences, such as a larger Barbie played by Sharon Rooney and a Barbie played by transgender actress Hari Neff. However, the movie doesn't draw attention to those differences either. This setup then frames whiteness, thinness, and cisgenderness as the starting place from which everything else deviates, usually by one distinct qualifier. However, Barbie Land makes sure to present all these deviations as neutral and equal within this world. The only differences that are acknowledged between the Barbies is their jobs. Astronaut, Supreme Court Justice, Doctor, and even male person. Their unique identities are not linked to their community, racial identity, gender identity, or size, but to their jobs, especially their high-functioning, high-status jobs. She might have started out as just a lady in a bathing suit, but she became so much more. She has her own money, her own house, her own car, her own career. They all fit within a system akin to modern-day corporatized America, just with a lot more pink and women, and their jobs are how they find their selfhood by identifying with what the system has assigned them at creation as their function for the larger corporate machine. And these jobs define you more than any other aspect of your identity. This fits well within the Barbie toy brand of the real world as Mattel sells this version of capitalistic achievement, the girl bossing of Barbie. This girl bossing a Barbie came about during the feminist movements of the 1960s where feminists despised Barbie for being seen as literally commodified femininity. So Mattel responded by creating different versions of Barbie as career women. However, these career women identities for Barbie were not meant to earnestly empower her, but to reflect a changing market while also generating new variations of the doll to get people to buy new products. Ruth Handler answers critics with another groundbreaking move, launching a new range of Barbies styled as career women. You kind of grow up and you think you're going to get married, have children, be a mom, clean the house, cook dinner. And Barbie is letting girls know mm -mm, a lot more to life than that. She changed the way little girls think. So for Barbie, her identity is found in both her career through capitalism as well as the commodification of those careers to sell these identities to women. This is also how Mattel associates Barbie with girldom as a market to sell to, which is very much a Western invention to commodify toys for either boys or girls. Until the 20th century, toys, including dolls, were sold in a gender-neutral manner. But then in the 1940s, companies like Mattel learned that they could sell new sets of clothing and toys if they marketed to girls and boys differently. Mattel itself was a big part of this process, being the ones to come up with the phrase action figure to distinguish from dolls for girls in order to sell toys like G.I. Joe to boys. The hurdle was getting over the fact that quote unquote, a boy will never play with a doll. It's an action figure. So the whole idea of Barbie for girls and then associating that product with a form of identity that this movie reinforces is rooted very much in capitalism. Yet despite how one would think that these different jobs would present different power distinctions within the society, such as Supreme Court Barbie or male Barbie having different classes, in actuality, there doesn't seem to be any material difference in Barbie's lives. They all live in luxury houses and drive luxury cars. Everyone has equal access to the same resources and the ability to follow their desires. The American dream made manifest. This is at odds with The Matrix, which itself reflects our current day reality of exploitation. Agent Smith in the movie even muses that humans recreate this exploitation and require it in order to generate the needed power for the machines who use them. Did you know that the first Matrix was designed to be a perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy? It was a disaster. No one would accept the program. Entire crops were lost. Barbie Land is a utopia, and The Matrix is not. And Neo in The Matrix is keenly aware of these power distinctions because he feels it himself as a low-level employee, while Barbie herself is blissfully unaware of the artificiality of her world. However, Barbie Land the film takes pains to immediately undercut Barbie Land's equality by showing us the Kens. The Kens don't have homes, likely live on the beach, and also don't have jobs. So the only way that the Barbies find a unique identity is actively denied to the Kens, who are just there to exist as an accessory to Barbie. Thank you, Barbie. Yeah. You know surfer's not even my job. I know. And it is not lifeguard, which is a common misconception. Very common. Yeah, because actually my job 
it's just beach. And this then sets up a clear, distinct power hierarchy within the Barbie world, one that both the Kens and Barbies are utterly unaware of due to it just being how the system works, with them seeing this as a natural dichotomy that Barbies sit at the top of. The film calls this a matriarchy, and we will use that term throughout this video, but to be clear, it's not really. Matriarchies do exist and don't really function in the same way with the commodification of people and defined by job function. Matriarchies have their own unique structures and issues. So what this actually is in Barbie Land is just patriarchy, but inversed. And we'll come back to this film's complete inability to envision a system other than variations upon capitalist patriarchy in a little bit. However, this matriarchy was created quite literally by the artificiality of Barbie Land. It was one dreamed up by Mattel. Is Barbie Land like an alternate reality or is it like a place where uh, your imagination yes. is? Yes. It's a false world where Barbie is a product and an idea, not something that can actually really exist in the natural world. Ultimately, stereotypical Barbie feels this artificiality too because like the Kens, she is denied a sense of identity. She is just the stereotype of the American dream, but does not have a job or a specific qualifier. This is what stereotypical Barbie is realizing when she thinks about death. It is the best day ever, and so is yesterday, and so is tomorrow, and so is the day after tomorrow, and even Wednesdays, and every day from now until forever. <laughs> Do you guys ever think about dying? She realizes that she's an idea, and that all of this is just not real, even by Barbie Land's rules. She realized that she's a product, not a human being with free will, living in a simulated reality made to extract her energy and labor for the material gain of someone else, namely Mattel. As the audience, we can see the artificiality of Barbie Land quite clearly from the first shot. But Barbie comes to understand it through her experience of aging and moments of thinking about morality that we all associate with our real life. Cellulite. Thus, Barbie's feminized system pushes us as the audience out and then draws us into a world that we recognize, framing the world of femininity as a product. Similarly though, in The Matrix, Neo feels something is wrong, that the system that he exists within is extracting energy from him, but it's the same world that we, the audience, recognize as our own. His realization of the world's artificiality comes metaphorically. As a trans woman who eventually sees Trinity, a woman living life beyond the boundaries of having to worry about working for a company. The person that Neo wants to be. Leading him to be given the choice of a red or blue pill by Morpheus. With the red pill symbolically looking like the estrogen pills that were red at the time of the film's release. Taking the red pill and going through the looking glass, through his reflection that reflects back at him someone that he is not, Neo can escape the system that commodifies him, allowing us as the audience to see how our real world outside of the film is a simulation. These distinctions between the two films are essential to understanding both movies' messages. In Barbie, it points out how the artificial pink of women's world is itself a fantasy product from the go, one that does not exist but one we all, including the women whom the film is speaking to, recognize quite clearly. The Matrix, conversely though, is made to draw its audience in to recognize that our real world is itself unnatural and artificial, something that we may not have already been thinking about when we came into the movie. We recognize women's world as a product, and Barbie highlights this, whereas The Matrix is trying to draw us into a more radical redefinition of our entire world. Yet like Neo, stereotypical Barbie goes to see Weird Barbie, who offers our protagonist the same red or blue pill style choice to escape the system and see the real world outside of the bounds of how she is commodified. You can go back to your regular life and forget any of this ever happened, or you can know the truth about the universe. The choice is now yours. This is clearly meant to reference the Matrix, but we do see a crucial difference here. Morpheus lives outside of the Matrix. We're never told in the film how he came to be outside the Matrix, but it's hinted that he had a similar realization as Neo around the Matrix's artificiality, but at a much younger age. It's not incidental then that Morpheus is cast as a black man, someone who in 1990s America would have been very much more directly dehumanized and ostracized by that system and thus more capable of recognizing the artificiality of it. In Barbie, Weird Barbie still lives within Barbie land, but as an ostracized citizen, again undercutting the equal status of the Barbies. 
She's also played by Kate McKinnon, who gives Weird Barbie a very queer-coded vibe just by the nature of her being Kate fucking McKinnon. I'd like to see what kind of nude blob he's packing under those jeans. <sighs> But Weird Barbie is also queer by Barbie Land's rules too. Not necessarily textually attracted to women, but someone who is not allowed to exist within the binary framework of the system and pushed aside by it. And what's weird will become weirder. And then you look like me. Ah! Oh. But she's not able to escape it like Morpheus. And we'll come back to that. Something that's also interesting is that while Neo instantly takes the red pill in the Matrix, stereotypical Barbie does not, wishing to stay in Barbie Land. The first one, the high heel. No, we'll do a redo. This is clearly done for comedy by subverting our expectations, but it is a distinct difference that we will also return to. Eventually Barbie, as well as Ken, who comes with Barbie seemingly out of kindness, but in reality because he has no identity outside of Barbie and thus wants to travel with her, both arrive in the real world. Neo has Trinity and Morpheus, but they are guides, not subservient to him like Ken. Neo then wakes up on the Nebuchadnezzar, a ship full of diverse outcasts who are generally all treated with equal humanity. In later films, we also have Zion, a society that lives without many resources, but still seems relatively egalitarian, a distinctly different world than the Matrix that Neo left. Both the Nebuchadnezzar and Zion represent distinctly different worlds and systems than the Matrix that Neo had left. But Ken and Barbie just find a binary opposite world to Barbie Land a patriarchy instead of a matriarchy, but which plays by similar but reversed rules. Jeez, you would think a construction site at lunchtime would be the perfect place for a little woman power, but this one was so male. Everything's almost like reversed here. It's important to note that we never see a world within Barbie that genuinely escapes this power hierarchy dynamic or presents itself as radically different in terms of its structures. However, Barbie does quickly begin to see how she is seen as an object to be gazed at by men and becomes very self-conscious of it and her body. I don't know the word for it, but I'm conscious, but it's myself that I'm conscious of. I'm not getting any of that. I feel what can only be described as admired, but not ogled. Having to hold both how she sees herself as well as how others see her as less than in her head at the same time. In contrast though, Ken finds himself able to exist like Barbie in Barbie Land, free from the burdens of being overtly objectified. Upon learning that Barbie is in the real world though, the Mattel Corporation works to get her back and literally put her in a box with one of the most on the nose visual metaphors ever seen in film. No one rests until this doll is back in a box. And it's worth discussing how the movie communicates the systems that try to put Barbie in that box. We have Mattel, but we also see the FBI informing on Barbie to Mattel, with them monitoring the entrance to Barbie Land. Thus, Mattel and the US government are visually portrayed as different sides of the same coin. Here we see corporations and neoliberal governments working together to oppress women, which is a strong, subtle message of the film. But on top of that, the working class folks are also framed as stuck in their cubicles without an exit, boxed in just like Barbie. However, this salient metaphor of capitalism and the neoliberalist government structures that uphold it is somewhat undone by the portrayal of the CEOs and men in charge of Mattel as endearing buffoons, who, in the end, are just able to learn their lesson and help out Barbie. <laughs> no, 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 don't hug me. Don't hug me. The Matrix series showcases those in charge of the Matrix as threatening, dangerous, and well aware of how their systems work. They're also well aware of Neo's resistances and able to survive it, but wish to stomp it out before it grows too big, even using Neo as a function to be able to get this done. Bullshit. Bullshit. Denial is the most predictable of all human responses. But rest assured, this will be the sixth time we have destroyed it. But in Barbie, they're just played as unwitting buffoons. Now, to be fair, this is partially due to the difference between the action and comedy of the two films. But still, the Barbie story is portraying the upper class as innocuous when they're really not. Barbie is made a product to be sold by a bunch of men so that they can keep their place of power at the top by selling her for more money. It reflects a society that will nominally accept women here and there as girl bosses, but not one that will ever allow them to hold systemic power because it is built off of denying them such. Could I just meet the woman in charge, your CEO? 
Oh, that would be me. And this system and those in charge of it do so with full awareness, not bumbling into it accidentally. Hell, the CEO even states he doesn't care if Ken sells well, he just wants to support women. But what does it matter if it's Barbie or Ken? The money is pouring in. Shame on you, executive number two. You think I spent my entire life in boardrooms because of a bottom line? No, I got into this business because of little girls and their dreams. Which is not how that would work at all. If the Ken doll somehow magically started selling better than Barbie, you bet your ass the quarterly profit Boca suits would shift their attention to Ken immediately. However, the men are also trying to sell an image of womanhood that props up how women can identify with their jobs for the system rather than self-actualized identities for themselves, while also framing them as beautiful and perfect pictures that women should aspire to by buying more women products, such as clothing and makeup. And it does so by selling a distinct version of beauty and femininity. Despite the Barbie movie having Sharon Rooney as a larger Barbie, Mattel in real life only ever released a Kirby Barbie in 2016, giving the doll wider hips, but still falling well within stereotypical beauty standards for women, thus highlighting how Barbie as a product continually reinforces the ideas of women reaching unrealistic beauty standards. These constantly changing beauty norms for Barbie were used to generate more sales. More fashion choices every year means that you had to buy new things in order to keep up with Barbie. This is ultimately reflective of the same beauty norms that women generally in our society have to keep up with. A new trend, a new clothing line to buy each year in order to spend your money on, in order to be considered beautiful and part of society. And these standards of beauty are themselves rooted in the history of the commodification of women. As historian Nell Irving Painter points out in her work, Europe began to colonize other nations throughout the world by the 18th century. And luxury enslaved people, people often gendered female, came to represent the epitome of human beauty. Beauty was linked with the enslaved and femininity, as we see in British traveler Edward Daniel Clark's musing on the notion of beauty of the Sicarsian slave women. Their women are the most beautiful, perhaps, in the world, of enchanting perfection of features and very delicate complexions, the females that we saw were all of them the accidental captives of war, who had been carried off together with their families. They were, however, remarkably handsome. We can see this link between femininity, enslavement, and beauty standards in things like the 19th century sculpture The Greek Slave by Haram Powers, a larger-than-life beautiful white woman wearing only chains across her wrist that we are meant to ogle at as unapproachable beauty. These ideas of slave women being used for sex, reproduction, and products to be gazed upon evolved further into the idea of womanhood we have today, one epitomized by stereotypical Barbie in her box. Her body is exploited to reinforce these beauty norms and notions of femininity as a deviation of manhood in order to service a system led by man's power ultimately, that just views them as a commodity. So the on-the-nose visual of Barbie being put into a box with her wrists literally being chained was a potent visual that resonated with many women because they understand how they themselves have become enslaved products. However, there is an important part of this that the Barbie movie directly ignores. And that's in how those beauty norms that I've been talking about th was created through a manufactured racial divide. As the 18th century signs of race develop in Europe, influential scholars refer to two kinds of slavery in their anthropological works. Nearly always, those associated with brute labor, Africans and Tartars primarily, emerged as ugly, while the luxury slaves those valued for sex and gendered as female. The Circassians, the Georgians, and Caucasians of the Black Seas regions came to figure as epitomes of human beauty. The idea of white feminine beauty standards could only exist through the contrast against folks who would later be racialized as black and seen as less human in order to justify their enslavement and used for labor. White feminine beauty was seen as desirable because it was in direct contrast to those seen as beasts of burden and inhuman, African folks who were taken for labor. And we can see how this idea of beauty was pushed into the mainstream of colonialist countries with works like Li Bain Turk, which showcases a harem of white women and a single black woman to highlight the contrast and beauty of the white enslaved women in the photo. 
womanhood beauty standards then, while always steeped in commodification of womanhood, was only created through the contrasting prism of whiteness. This also points to how black women and femmes are masculinized in a Eurocentric viewpoint, yet simultaneously fetishized. Take Sardaki Bartman, for example, a Kokoi woman who was caged and paraded as a freak show attraction throughout 19th century Europe, and ghoulishly after her death had her brain, skeleton, and sexual organs remaining on display in Paris until 1974, showcasing how black bodies were commodified and seen as less than human deviations. This dehumanization of black women's bodies continues to this day, with even Kim Kardashian controversially playing on the Sardaki Bartman image on a magazine cover. Yet despite this, black feminine features and art set so many body trends that have then become commodified on white women's bodies, such as Anne Lowe and Zelda Wynn Valdez creating hip-defining busty gowns and even the Playboy Bunny outfit. Black women's fashion and bodily features are desirable by a corporatized male gaze that then sells these images of women just as long as it's not on black women's bodies. Even things like devaluing larger body types on women directly comes from colonialization efforts to devalue the curvier bodies of black women. But this is crucial to understand why Barbie fails to have a substantive critique on the systems that it's attempting to address because it refuses to engage with relevant intersections. Think back to how all the other Barbies that we saw at the beginning of the movie were seen as deviations from stereotypical Barbie, where racial divisions don't exist or are acknowledged despite there being very clear superficial diversity. The film wants to be and in fact was celebrated for its diversity, but refuses to discuss why that diversity would matter, especially within the conversations around womanhood. It all goes to this belief in the story that we tell in our society today. The idea that there is a universal human experience and protagonist that can exist sans the context of a person's life. That is ultimately a straightforward mechanism of capital. It's a story that we believe in our society that we can all become a protagonist if we work hard to achieve what we want in America. That there's a central person to the story of America whose background in class, gender, race, or even their interests as a person are unimportant to their successful navigation of that narrative. To ultimately become the successful hero of the story, one that achieves their dreams and job and function within the status quo. One might think that there are some ways within the story that capitalism will address issues of racism or sexism in order to say that people overcome it to become that protagonist. But usually it comes down to individualized ideas of tokenistic inclusion, like a black Supreme Court justice or girl boss CEOs, or pointing out the harm that individual racists, whether they be someone just at the grocery store that someone encounters or a boss that someone has to deal with that says bigoted things. But that's about as far as capitalism will acknowledge this form of racism and sexism within its systems because it's trying to centralize the idea that racism, sexism, and all other forms of bigotries are individual issues. Certain people are just bad people and we can beat them. It's not the system's fault. Yet we know that race and gender itself prevent many people from getting to those positions of power within our systems. The years of devaluing and eliminating black communities' access to capital, for example, or the discrimination against transgender identities prevents many from ever reaching that same level of success. That man got a house in an area that grew tremendously for white people who were able to get in there and did not grow for the many hundreds, if not thousands, an unknowable number of black people who were not able to get in there. And, and confronting that simple fact in this one county, which is, by the way, representative of all kinds of other counties around every big city in America, this is still leading to inequity. A person's entire situation and their ability to achieve a certain level of success within the system is determined by many decisions or aspects that are entirely out of their control. And these only exist because of the class differences that are generated through things like race, gender, private property ownership, and more. All literally built upon these divisions that colonialization itself generated as we've been discussing in terms of the racial divide in how we think about womanhood and feminine beauty and how that ultimately ultimately became itself a commodification in order to uphold those in power. I think one of the hardest things sometimes about white feminism TM is that sometimes they don't realize that they can be the oppressor to other people. And yeah. so that's what makes stories about like blanket womanhood so incomplete is because our womanhoods are not the same. Enslaved Black women had gender as biology, but not in society. 
they were not women in societal needs only as biologically women because their purpose was to breed but they had none of the benefits of what it was aligned to be seen as culturally a woman. We literally have a history of womanhood being denied to us because we did not align with what people thought women were supposed to be, which was whiteness. Yeah. And I think with with Barbie, if it could have a monologue about you got to be to this and to that and to blind, to blind, to blah, it can have a thing about race and gender, mm. you know. But I think fundamentally, Margot Robbie produced the movie through her company lucky chap she's very talented she can deliver stereotypical barbie with pathos but fundamentally you need someone else in that role for Mm -hmm. it to work but you can't sell that same movie to anybody non-white people have learned to see white people and default them as well that's like the double consciousness sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So like, so it's like anyone could put themselves onto whiteness because that's a default. But as soon as you make Barbie black, then it's black Barbie or Asian Barbie or trans Barbie. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and then now I can't just sit back and watch the movie. People will, people will hear that speech and it'll be, it'll you know, it's still woke. But like now Joe Rogan won't like it. You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but let's take a pause here because I bet many of you are wondering, Jesse, yes, this is interesting, but what does this have to do with the Barbie movie? Why is this racial critique on femininity and beauty standards something that the Barbie movie needs to address? Isn't this a movie just about womanhood, not race? And I fully understand that immediate impulse, but this is crucial to understand why Barbie fails to have a substantive critique on the systems that it's attempting to address because it refuses to engage with relevant intersections. All of this is the myth that capitalism wants to sell, this propagation of a narrative that suggests a neutrality of human experience that is essentially natural in the way the world works, that it's how it's always been, not because that's how the system of capital made them work. Now, to be fair, Barbie does challenge this narrative through the prism of gender solely but it ignores the racial contrast that those gender expectations and divisions were built upon and sells the myth that race is a non-issue when confronting gender. This thinking had its groundwork laid well into modern American feminist movements. Take Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, a foundational feminist text that itself established the idea of white woman as the woman and the subject of feminism, as writer Rafi Zarkia points out in her book Against White Feminism. In comparing women to others who include blacks and Jews, de Beauvoir reveals herself to be thinking of women as only white Catholic women. From the very introductory pages of The Second Sex, de Beauvoir identifies otherness as the fundamental category and women as the ultimate other, in a way similar to how the natives of a country see inhabitants of other countries as foreigners. Jews as the others for anti-Semites, Blacks for racist Americans, Indigenous peoples for colonists, proletarians for the propertied classes. In de Beauvoir's view, then, the justifications for inferior contradictions of race, class, and caste are not just comparable, but rather the same. In this way, she she each of these as discrete systems of oppression that could be compared but did not overlap. In every comparison that de Beauvoir makes between women and blacks, however, the blacks are assumed to be American and male and the women are assumed to be white. This willful disengagement from perceiving intentions within a discussion of feminism is actually intentionally incentivized by our system, playing with white women's understanding of how they exist within a generated hierarchical dichotomy of men versus women, but insulating them from understanding that there is an underclass that is generated through intersections of gender with economic, racial, religious, and other generative hierarchies that themselves were framed against white womanhood. As a result, it allows those who fall into this idea of feminism, namely mostly white women, though not solely, to play into this binary fight of against the patriarchy while simultaneously pushing down others who speak on the necessary intersectionality required to accurately deconstruct the systems of white supremacy and capital that those standards of white womanhood were built upon to commodify others. By the way, When I say white supremacy throughout this video, I am not talking about neo-Nazi style white supremacists. So don't run to my comments saying that I'm calling Barbie or Greta Gerwig a Nazi. 
And until you showed up here and declared yourself Barbie, I hadn't thought about you in years, you fascist. What I'm talking about is the system of interlocking institutions that makes whiteness seem like the norm upon which everything else is less valuable variations upon. Barbie then presents this same capitalistic myth to focus on an invented men versus women binary that frames whiteness as the norm and the only way that we can talk about these issues through. Again, to be fair to Barbie, it does attempt to address some racial context in subtle ways, most obviously through America Ferreira's character, Gloria, who we learn was the owner of Stereotypical Barbie and the cause for why Barbie realized her artificiality in Barbie Land. Yes! Irrepressible thoughts of death Barbie! Oh my god! I am cellulite! <gasps> We see Gloria, a Latino character, working as a secretary at Mattel, highlighting her lack of access to the dream Barbie high-achieving jobs as both a woman and a Latino person within a patriarchal world. We also get hints that her family faced money issues through her backstory and offhanded dialogue with her daughter. And it's these struggles with achieving the American dream that Gloria faces that potentially led to stereotypical Barbie having her own realization within Barbie Land, mirroring Gloria's frustration with trying to achieve that dream. However, this is never given textual discussion within a movie that is very overt about its gendered critiques, because whenever Gloria speaks about the issues she faces as a woman, most notably in her famous monologue, she only ever highlights the dichotomy of expectations that women generally face sans any racialized aspect. We have to always be extraordinary, but somehow we're always doing it wrong. As additionally, as a child, she played with stereotypical Barbie, the white Barbie, highlighting her identification with whiteness and womanhood, something that never gets brought up. But it also made me uncomfortable with, with America Ferrera being the one to deliver that weird speech, because I feel like so much of her career has been defined by being a plus size curvy woman in Hollywood until fairly recently. Like for so long, she was the person that was put on the opposite side of Barbie. And like, as someone who remembers her in Ugly Betty, for example, where like the whole thing is that she is this person coming in this space of very thin beauty standards. It also shows this shift of how the pop culturization of feminism is trying to bring in as many women as possible and sort of like smoothing over the different ways that we can marginalize each other within the idea of womanhood. And it's also interesting that Gloria is a Latino character, who are characters that are often treated as white in mainstream movies and TV. Many Latino Americans who live in the United States are descended from immigrant groups who only came to the US within the past century or so. And what that often entails ideologically is a sense of buying into US culture. You are motivated by US propaganda to believe in the myth of the American dream that if you work hard, you can move up the ladder and your family will succeed because you were trying to escape a situation that was much worse for you when you immigrated to the United States. It's a sense of, of opportunity. You know, my story is uh, not very different than so many other you know, Latinos who you know, grew up in, in uh, communities where they had to work hard to, to get by. Now, to be very clear, I am not saying that Latino Americans do not face a shit ton of racism and hate for being immigrants. I mean, just look at any Republican speaking for longer than five seconds on immigration policy to know that that isn't true. But what I am trying to speak to is the culture of how American mainstream art, like Barbie, will treat a Latino experience as almost indistinguishable from a white experience in order to propagate this myth of a neutral experience that Gloria as a character fits well within. Let me frame it in a different way to help you understand what I'm trying to say here. It's the same way as how white women characters like Captain Marvel or Rey in Star Wars are treated as stoic, contextless men in order to give the superficial appearance of women protagonists without actually writing these characters as women. Captain Marvel or Rey don't really deal with any overt experiences of womanhood until they have to to be framed against male characters. I have nothing to prove to you. Otherwise, you could have just put men into these characters and they would have functioned exactly the same way in the story. Barbie, at the very least as a film, is not doing that because it's directly addressing a woman's perspective. We can also see this idea again in Barbie in how the principal Ken beyond Ryan Gosling is Simi Liu, an Asian man. 
And so by framing an Asian Ken is secondary to the principal Ken of Ryan Gosling, it serves a sort of feminization of Asian men as secondary to the more dominant aggressive white dude, but still also plays into this neutrality of experience and tokenistic diversity. It's also interesting, by the way, that the two racial identities most subject to violent colonialization efforts within American history, black folks and indigenous folks, are either non-existent within Barbie or relegated to tertiary roles. That being said, indigenous folks are mentioned within Barbie in a single line. Oh my God, this is like in the 1500s with the indigenous people in smallpox. They had no defenses against it. Numerous indigenous folks within America were quick to call out that line as something intensely problematic. Barbie's comparison of patriarchy slash women to smallpox and indigenous people reeks of white feminism. Patriarchy and smallpox are both products of colonialism. However, this comparison not only erases native women, but comparing structural oppression to outright genocide cheapens both. So not only does Barbie never showcase indigenous folks, despite Mattel having released numerous native Barbie dolls, but it also makes light of their genocide by comparing it to something that it is not really comparable to. On top of this, the film has a visual Mount Rushmore gag, which itself was built upon Paha Sapa, a mountain that is sacred to some indigenous tribes and was stolen from them. This was another joke within the film that ignored the treatment of indigenous people, leading many indigenous folks to understandably call Barbie an anti-native film. Going back to our larger discussion though, this is why right-wing outrage against Barbie the movie mentions the wokeness of the diverse cast, but focuses primarily on how the movie supposedly hates men instead. I find it upsetting when material that is based on children's IP, marketed to little girls, actually ends up being angry feminist claptrap that alienates men from women, undermines basic human values, and promotes falsehood all at the same time. Barbie itself centralizes womanhood in whiteness and plays into the capital L liberal myth of neutral human experience, despite existing within a system built on colonialization and exploitation of labor through generated gender and racial divides. What this does then is allow the film to centralize the myth of a binary us versus them fight here shown as men versus women without giving that broader context. Moving on though, while Barbie can't be a person in Barbie land or the real world due to her womanhood preventing her from ever moving beyond being seen as product, Ken can pursue what he thinks is self-actualization as he finds within the patriarchy. This is the first time in his life when he's not seen as a secondary accessory and he relishes in the power. He then brings this concept back to Barbie Land and immediately makes it a cartoonish, childlike approximation of patriarchal society that the other Barbies quickly fall into, having no context to judge this new system by. It's like a spa day for my brain, forever. <laughs> what is wrong with him? This reveals that Ken's ultimate motivation is not to undo the system that he lived under, but a desire to get revenge and to do unto others what was done to him. He wants to get back at the Barbies, specifically stereotypical Barbie, for how he was treated. How's that feel? It is not fun, is it? as well as also ride a horse. Let's just be honest, like, I really hope that Ken gets to live his best life as a horse girl, love that for him. But ultimately, this is a false framing fueled upon the binary way of seeing this conflict that falls into the propaganda of upholding these systems. Take, for example, how part of the propaganda to limit the enfranchisement of black folks in the post-Civil War South was done by the former slave owners in the South arguing that if they gave blacks too much power then, they would just kill all the white people. Or put white people into slavery while they didn't work when in actuality most black Americans were just looking for a way to be able to survive on their own when they didn't have anything post-slavery. Ken's desire to view the fighting sides as one versus the other places conflicts between oppressed and oppressors as one simply where the oppressed just wish to become the exploiters instead of actually creating a new system or egalitarian society. It's this idea that those who are being exploited can only envision the world of being the exploiter. Compare this though to The Matrix. The goal of Neo and the rest of the freedom fighters in Zion is not to go and oppress the machines themselves, it's actually to create a world accessible for all. It can envision a microcosm of the society within Zion itself, albeit one deeply oppressed under attack and resource strain, but one that does seem to have a very anarchistic feel to its power structures generally. 
In Matrix Resurrections, which actually is one of my favorite movies and is much better than others say it is, see my video on that, we see that machines are also a part of the resistance movement itself, understanding how they as machines are harmed. Machines are on our side now? They are Synthians. It's a word they prefer to machines. That's what I meant. What you changed that nobody believed could ever be changed. The meaning of our side. The Matrix is saying that machinarchy hurts everyone, including machines. But unlike Ken, the machines aren't motivated to just recreate a version where they can get revenge on those who hurt them. This belief that the oppressed class only seeks revenge against its oppressors relies on the assumption that one must only be able to exist within its reflection, that the world naturally only works within a predator-prey dynamic. Yet this story is but a propaganda tool of systems based on the commodification of labor, one that places us, both the exploiter and the exploited, in the minds of those doing the exploitation. The best way to illustrate this is with the concept of the master-slave dialectic as articulated by Hegel, which I'll explain using an abridged version as articulated by David Mura in his excellent book, The Stories Whiteness Tells Itself. For the master, only one set of definition delineates the relationship of the master and the slave. The master is the one who rules and orders the slave to do the master's bidding. The slave is the one who obeys the master. The master is a free human being. The slave is neither free nor completely human. For the slave, the master's definitions of master and the slave are a reality and a truth that the slave must acknowledge in order to remain alive. The definition of the slave as a slave is the master's definition. The slave also has another set of definitions. The master is the oppressor. The slave is the oppressed. The slave is not a slave, but a free human being who has been imprisoned by the master. The slave's freedom lies in their ability not to see themselves as a slave. The slave's freedom lies in creating definitions of both master and the slave different from the definition the master uses. There is, therefore, a difference between the consciousness of the master and that of the slave. The master must believe that the only valid set of definitions of master and slave are the one the master divines and assigns. For the master, there exists only one way of viewing the world, that of the master. The view of the slave, the view of the other, does not exist. Indeed, it cannot exist if the master is truly the master and the slave truly the slave. Those in the top of a power hierarchy can only ever really envision things from their perspective. Thus, they always assume that those beneath them wish to become like them, the exploiters, because that's the only way that they are told to understand the world. This is what is being expressed when you hear folks, even those who consciously support black equality, talking about anti-white racism. It is this anxiety of the privileged that the oppressed just wish to subjugate their oppressors. The concept of anti-white racism frames hatred against white people as something that then can co-opt the institutions of white supremacy to become a black supremacist society. You know, I don't know if you're like me, but when I first heard that class, I was like, what the heck is that suggesting that there's a problem with white people or whiteness <laughs> and there's a solution? I mean, you know, what's going on here? This is insane. This is clearly racist. It's clearly anti-white vilifying movements that seek to humanize the colonized as themselves fascistic. Without realizing this would be impossible within our system built on centuries of institutionalized and propagandized dehumanization that ultimately supports whiteness as a norm. This belief is itself propaganda that has been so normalized within our cultural rhetoric and mindset that it is taken as a given in how we depict revolutionary movements within our fictions, like Barbie. I mean, take how Ken in the film is easily able to turn a matriarchy into a patriarchy using the institutions that women supposedly control. It was just that simple for him. And now you're making it permanent with a special election to change the Constitution. That's right. In just 48 hours, all the Kens will head to the polls and vote to change the Constitution to a government for the Kens, of the Kens, and by the Kens! Yet the film doesn't really see this as a problem as women just vote themselves back into power later. Thus upholding the myth that these institutions could just go one way or the other in terms of a power dynamic, rather than the truth that these institutions are built upon these hierarchical demands regardless and will ultimately uphold them no matter who is put into office. We are told to subconsciously see anti-white and anti-black racism as equivalent, to have it as an ever-present anxiety within us, even if we understand the systemic danger done to the marginalized, because we are not asked to envision a system without oppressor and oppressed dynamics. So all we can do is imagine a world where we become the oppressed if the current system where we benefit even nominally from is torn down. Thus, we uphold institutionalized racism for fear of being treated the way that we have seen others be treated 
by our institutions. And then this anxiety is then used to propagate the idea that decolonialization movements, typically led by marginalized groups, are themselves inherently fascistic, just as people claiming things like Land Back or Black Lives Matter are fascistic movements. I wanted to ask Black Lives leaders about this. We contacted all 14 chapters. Not one would agree to an interview. I wish they would. I really wanted to ask them if they've noticed that they and white supremacists now promote similar things. If I could be reductionist, Americans think in power, like mm -hmm. American diplomatic relations when it comes to even the Bahamas, what did they donate to us? They donate a fleet of cars to police our cities, nothing to create public goods, but Increase. something to police our people, something yeah. to subjugate our people. Power in that case is not something that is given. It's not something that's surrendered. Um, in a realist perspective, power is something that is taken. Mm -hmm. So when you have a people who is used to having power over another people, they don't see a reality where power is something to be shared or a reality where folks can be equal and that's fine. They can only engage in a discourse and a negotiation of power where, okay, either you take it from my dead prying hands or I will continue to subjugate you because as soon as I stop, you will do that to me. Thus, when they write fiction from this perspective, they ultimately only write the oppressed class wishing to become the oppressors, thus creating this idea that there only can ever be power hierarchies because the oppressed class can only ever want to become the top of the hierarchy, not create something new. In actuality, the oppressed class, when understanding a fight beyond just a binary, can recognize that there are other ways to view the world because they inherently have to hold two different versions of the world in their own head at all times to understand their own personhood when they are also being commodified by the world around them. Barbie then reflects this propaganda of the exploiting class because it creates a world where the characters can only see things in us versus them instead of the complex interplay of race, gender, and class and how more people are dehumanized within the system and thus eroding conversations across those lines and only to ever frame things as one versus the other and needing the other to exist in order to have identity. They can only see things in this master-slave dialectic. And this narrative comes up in much of our mainstream fiction. The revolutionaries are seen as just wanting revenge instead of desiring to create something new. See every single MCU villain from Killmonger to the Flag Smashers. There are still people in there. This is the only language these people understand. I mean, there is a video in me about secret invasion in Marvel for exactly this reason, among numerous others. And all of this is shown as inevitable because Barbie never shows or bothers to articulate an alternative society like The Matrix does. It's so easy to forget how much noise the Matrix pumps into your head until you unplug. Yeah. Something else makes the same kind of noise, takes over every damn thing, just like the Matrix. War. I stood at the barricade of the temple, staring at the army of sentinels waiting for them to kill every one of us. But then, they left. And they said, you saved us. I didn't believe it. Every night I would dream of attack sirens. But then, I would wake up to this. Silence. I'm ashamed of it now, my pessimism of how long it took me to believe a world without war was possible. While in the scene Nairobi is textually talking about literal war between man and machine, philosophically the scene is pointing to the idea that we don't need to create binary hierarchies, that we can create a world beyond it, which it visually shows through the machines being part of Zion. Yet Barbie never really gives us a moment like this outside of lip service that we'll talk about in just a minute. And this speaks perhaps to the film's lack of imagination. Barbie ultimately stops Ken's takeover of Barbie Land, but only through reinforcing stereotypes of women. The Barbies use their feminine wiles to sick men against each other, leading the Kens to vent their anger and frustration after being tricked into seeing each other as rivals based off of their romantic frustration with controlling the Barbies. And now they destroy themselves. You know what I think? I think we should put our freaking constitution back. While this is framed as an empowering moment, 
It plays to the idea that women are inherently manipulative and that our strength relies on the desirability of our beauty, which again, we've already discussed, lies in the commodification of ourselves. And this also ignores how men who grow up in a patriarchy who view women as their property that is then taken by another man and wish to assert that ownership through violence are often just as likely, if not more likely, to enact that violence against their woman as they see as an object owned by them as they are against the men who they see taking the woman away. This exact myth of women as object and thing to be commodified is exactly why we see a higher rate of domestic abuse directed towards women than at men. So this moment that's shown to be empowering in the Barbie movie is actually really, in truth, a perilous place to frame women within. The film, then, is framing women's disempowered status as both natural and positive, showcasing a failure of the film to truly envision a matriarchal-style society that's removed from the context of a patriarchy and leaning into misogyny while trying to tell us that it's empowerment. This then roots itself all the way in the Catholic idea of original sin, with women being seen as manipulative and sinful, causing men and women to gain self-awareness by eating from the tree of knowledge, just like how Barbie brought Ken to the real world, thus causing them to have to leave the Garden of Eden. This story also frames women as but a deviation of white men, created from his rib, and men and women themselves being above nature and animals getting to name them, rather than being a part of that system, creating an idea of an intrinsic power hierarchy that is naturalized in nature, thus justifying all other power hierarchies. This parallel to the inherent sinful nature of womanhood is not incidental, with Greta Gerwig even stating Barbie was inspired in part by her Catholic upbringing. In the movie, it's like when it starts, she's in a she's in a world where there's no aging or death or pain or shame or self-consciousness, and then she suddenly becomes self-conscious, which that's a really old story. Uh, that's we know that story, and I I think I kind of always go back to those older story forms because I I don't know I went to Catholic school and I resonate with them. So even as she's trying to subvert this viewpoint as empowering, she's still replicating it without dismantling it. Barbie then eventually shows compassion for Ken by passing on the idea that it's Barbie and it's Ken. Maybe all the things that you thought made you you aren't really you. And this is a beautiful idea within the film, that men and women can define themselves separate from each other instead of against each other, breaking down this idea of a binary system that I have been talking about this entire video. Yet this idea is only shown to be lip service, because in the depatriarchalized, that's definitely a word, Barbie land, the same status quo of women in charge is reasserted by the end of the film, with the Kens only being given tokenistic acceptance just like women in the real world patriarchy are. It's literally stated in the narrator's voice. The Kens will have as much power and influence in Barbie land as women have in the real world. Thus, it's the film not being able to articulate an egalitarian society, and even more importantly, not allowing the Kens to define themselves outside of Barbie, despite them saying that Ken should be able to do this. The Kens still will face dehumanization through their Kenness, associated with manhood. Likewise, the film doesn't really challenge the patriarchy of our world either. The ending of the film seems to say that these hierarchies are merely the way things are, and we cannot fundamentally alter them, merely slowly, gradually make tiny steps or minor alterations to it to make it slightly better for everybody. That's a terrible idea. Yeah, that's going to make money. Oh, yeah. uh, Ordinary Barbie, I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, great. Great. Cool. Yeah. We got it. I think we're good, right? <laughs> it outright does not view liberation from patriarchy or the inverse patriarchy of Barbie land as even being possible. And this is ultimately my biggest frustration with Barbie because it plays right into this idea that men and women will always be at odds with each other. Numerous defenders of Barbie made fun of Ben Shapiro and the endless wave of right-wing outrage merchants claiming Barbie was woke because it hated men. And rightly so, because every time these outraged merchants say that, they showcase their lack of media literacy because they miss the very overt message of Barbie, that patriarchy hurts everyone, men included, because it's a system that places us into a commodified binary that forces us to dehumanize each other and ourselves. That's what the film gives lip service to, at least. 
but Barbie as a film still serves someone like Ben Shapiro's interests in preaching to his audience that the film is man-hating because the movie doesn't present a way to see men or women as living free of this dichotomy and instead says that it's only ever going to be this way and that's all it could be. Takeaway is that men deserve to be oppressed mm. in the way that they perceive themselves having been oppressed. That's disgusting. That's not equality. I thought feminism was about equality, Nathan. It's not. This is the evidence and proof that modern day feminism isn't about equality, it's about power. You might have thought that what you were going to get was Ken gets treated with respect as a person and Barbie gets treated with respect as a person. And that's a better, nope, wrong. In the end, not to skip ahead, Barbie land just gets restored and the men are still subservient. That's the best, that's the best version of the world. It only articulates a binary just reversed as the ultimate catharsis when Kens are told to be able to find their own identity. While it gives an underbaked emotional gesture to Ken's humanity, it still declares that men have to suffer just as women suffer for things to ultimately be fair, that we need to get some sort of revenge. The film fails to generate an ultimate praxis that we can exist without revenge or that we can work towards something new. All stemming from the film's inability to see beyond its limited perspective of binary, cis-normative, white patriarchal concepts of gender. It, it, especially like um, A Will to Change, Arabella, and mm -hmm. for those that aren't familiar with it, that is just like a, a deep dive into men and mask, men's role in mm -hmm. feminism and why exactly uh, we, cis men in particular, especially Black men, are supposed to and desperately need to engage with feminist rhetoric. It's not me helping women by engaging with feminist, feminist rhetoric. Yeah. It's helping myself. It's healing myself. It's mm -hmm. um, it's bringing myself to wholeness. Whenever I see these not like other girl alt right girl is talking about like feminism has left behind men and how feminism fails men. I'm like, so you guys have never read like bell hooks or like any of the like women of color feminists who are very much concerned with men of color mm -hmm. because of racism, because of the impact of imperialism, because of how our bodies as mothers, those of us who, who can become mothers and want to become mothers, how that impacts our relationship to our sons and how they become men and how they treat their partners. And so there is an investment for women of color to have equality with men that puts them on the same platform which is different from like white feminism because white women are used to being depending on their class and location being already paradigms mm. and being treated as accessories within that paradigm nature and i think that's a really interesting thing to look at with barbie is like this is what white men think that white women want a lot of these spaces actually criticize Bell Hooks um, because of the fact that like she is willing to extend this olive branch, even a thorn, even a thorned olive branch, if I would say, for us to grab onto because there are some feminists that would levy like, okay, it's women's time, it's women and femmes time, we need to rise up and we need to give retribution um, mm -hmm. to the agents of patriarchy. And I understand the frustration. I can't tell people who have witnessed femicide, especially like black femicide, that they need to look at us when I look like they're abusers and they need to treat us with compassion. I, I, It's a very difficult conversation. However, when you engage in this hostile, vitriolic, um, let me get revenge on men, it's, it's a dish served for both. You're hurting yourself and you're also um, perpetuating a reality where I can then feel justified in hurting you yeah. as a woman or femme. And this is all because the movie is ultimately a product by Mattel wishing to sell both more Barbie toys and its upcoming film franchises. If we were to be even more cynical, one could argue a major goal of this film was to sell more Ken dolls, and thus the movie trying to be more focused towards men rather than it being towards women, which we can see in the fact that clearly Ryan Gosling is having a lot more fun being in this film than Margot Robbie, who has the weight of the world on her shoulders when trying to portray this part. The film is not interested in presenting an alternative system because it wants to uphold this one. We can see this most clearly in the few times Barbie in the film addresses non-binary identities. And when I say non-binary identities, I don't mean non-binary in terms of how we think about it in today in a gender identity context, as myself being non-binary in our real world today, but non-binary in the fact that these identities fall outside of the dichotomy of Ken and Barbie, most notably with Weird Barbie, Alan, and Midge, which many people know as Pregnant Barbie. Yeah, you thought I would forget about them, did you? I will never forget my beautiful boy, Alan. Alan. Not that Alan. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused about that. But first, some of you might be saying, but what about transgender Barbie? 
But this is my point when I talk about non-binary identities. Because while it's nice that we have a transgender actress getting a paycheck for playing a Barbie, and Hari Neff is amazing and you should go watch her in Assassination Nation, within the movie, her trans identity is not actually a part of her. It doesn't really exist within the world of the film. She just passes as a binary presenting Barbie. She's trans because we as the audience recognize the actress as a transgender actress, but within the context of the film, she's not trans at all. She just feels fantastic in plastic and seems to have always existed within this version of Barbie Land. This is why, by the way, there was no overt outrage by conservatives towards Hari Neff being in the film, because she just fades into the background. Her transness non-existent. She's like all the other supporting Kens and Barbies, almost exclusively played by marginalized people as basically functional sexy lamps. The film, outside of discussing misogyny, has a complete disregard to conversation about the bigotry that marginalized people experience. What if they were to showcase Hari Neff's transness in a way that meant something within the context of the film? Did she change from being a Ken to a Barbie? And what would that mean within Barbie Land? It also speaks to Mattel having zero interest in selling a transgender Barbie to the market with this movie. The closest that they've come to ever having a transgender Barbie is an expensive Laverne Cox doll. But what part of Hari Neff's Barbie as identity would be meaningful to sell as a product to Mattel? A trans flag? A queer club to hang out in? That would just ultimately give them backlash from right-wing conservatives that they were trying to avoid. Her trans identity is not commodifiable and thus not reflected upon within the film. This film's unwillingness to engage with a trans Barbie also leads to some odd choices with Hari Neff's character. During both montages of the Barbies, first when they are brainwashed and secondly when they are tricking the Kens, Hari Neff's Barbie is given lines that stand out to a degree from the rest of the Barbies. First with, You're a doctor! I like being a helpful decoration. And second with, I am so awkward and don't feel pretty at all, and will anyone ever like me? While both those lines are trying to comment on how women are treated, it feels particularly odd to me that specifically the character played by a trans woman is singled out to be viewed as a sex object for men's gratification. Trans women are very often treated as sex objects, and I don't think that this was intentional by the film, but as with so many other elements of the film, it ends up handling marginalized people in questionable ways because it does not recognize or even pay attention to how those marginalizations would play within the context of the lines that the film is giving them, because it's not paying attention to them at all. In the first sequence, the women are all doing things for the men, and their lines reflect common elements of sexism, but it is very specifically the trans woman who is just a sexy object. These lines weren't given to trans Barbie incidentally, but also probably not consciously, likely reflecting Greta Gerwig's unconscious biases surrounding trans people that she hadn't yet reckoned with. Hari Neff's Barbie almost outright says she is a sexy lamp, and really she is never treated as much more than that by the film. Now, we do have Alan, who was an actual toy sold as Ken's buddy that only briefly existed from 1964 to 66 and ultimately was discontinued because it didn't sell well. And this is reflected in the fact that his identity is not sellable in the universe of Barbie and is seen as distinctly different from the Kens. As a result, Alan is a non-binary identity within Barbie Land who doesn't fit into the dichotomy of Ken versus Barbie. But he also never has any access to a place within this world. And he's shown to be frustrated with people's lack of caring for him. Not one person would care if Alan was in the real world. In fact, it's happened before. All of NSYNC. Alan. But in many ways, the film itself seems uncaring or uninterested in him, despite him being my favorite boy. My beautiful, beautiful favorite boy. He is ultimately included with the women when trying to reassert Barbie Land's matriarchy out of a sense of allyship to them that again frames his identity as being with the marginalized, but not something shown when he was interacting with the Kens. It's also implied that he's more aware of the artificiality of the world, given that he's aware of other Alans that existed within the real world. Still, his long-term hopes are unclear beyond wishing to have some way to self-actualize himself. And because of this nebulousness with the character, I've seen many people identify with Alan in the film. I had gay men, non-binary folks, trans folks, people of color, and others tell me that they saw themselves in Alan, despite his limited screen time, because Alan feels like an actual person living within the systems around him and realizing that he doesn't fit within it. He's not a prop, nor a simplistic symbol of these systems. He does present an option to see beyond these systems, but ultimately becomes more of a missed opportunity because the film doesn't know what to do with him. We also have Weird Barbie. As I said before, she's an ostracized member of the Barbies, clearly queer-coded, yet still shown through a white perspective, ignoring the queer people of color that also exist, and underscoring how we often frame the LGBT community as holistically white. Taking out that pin from earlier, we talked about the difference between Morpheus and Weird Barbie, where Morpheus ultimately wants to destroy the Matrix, Weird Barbie ultimately decides to make her ostracization in Barbie Land just work for her. 
I'm sorry we called you Weird Barbie behind your back and also to your face. It's okay. I'm owning it. This goes to the idea that queerness is fine with being nominally accepted off to the side, another deviation of whiteness, but never fully being integrated or centralized. She's also given a job in the president's cabinet. Would you like a job in my cabinet? May I please have sanitation? Which I can't help but feel is like the tokenistic inclusion of gay men that modern day Democrats often wield. It reads how often many white, queer, and trans folks are often asked to endlessly align with Joe Biden or the Democratic Party because they accept us and will nominally make allusions to fighting for our community without actually doing anything demonstrable legislatively to do so, or that we should just be happy with rainbow merch being sold to us in stores with never actually being able to be accepted or liberated or even really discussed in any meaningful way. We're also left unsure if the system will completely change on us with the next election and ostracize us even further, and how we're blamed if things do get worse, because we didn't vote hard enough, or because we critiqued how we are treated and asked for full acceptance. Ultimately, Barbie says that queer people should just make being the outcast work for us, despite being told that we're ugly and unwanted, even by those who demand our solidarity when they faced ostracization. This brings us to Midge, who is interesting. At the end of the film, Midge briefly freaks out the Mattel suits, a joke at how pregnancy, an overt display of difference in womanhood to men, scares those men. Midge, Cat, I thought we discontinued her. Midge is also accepted by Barbie society, not ostracized from it, but is still seen as weird, showcasing an acceptance of how women have been controlled and objectified through their ability to reproduce through things like abortion rights fights, while also still framing pregnancy as this weird thing of womanhood. A pregnant white woman is seen as a deviation from a thin, ready-to-reproduce white woman who is more desirable by a system that exploits the literal labor of cis women's bodies. The film also exclusively uses her for a joke, and the narration and characters look at her quite negatively, just another plastic prop played by a person. And this leaned into the major ultimate problem of the Barbie movie's white feminism. Just as Ken does not have a job to identify himself against, our lead Barbie is just stereotypical Barbie. I'm not adventure Barbie, I'm stereotypical Barbie. I'm like the Barbie you think of when someone says, think of a Barbie, that's me. Her role is quite literally to be a white woman. She doesn't have a sense of identity outside of the system or function of womanhood that she has. She does not have a queer, ethnic, historical, or religious culture to find herself within because they have been specifically stripped away from her when she was commodified and taken to be enslaved. Thus, she only has womanhood to fight back against the system from, even as she recognizes that that identity is dehumanized commodification. Whiteness then robs white women of an identity to find themselves through. It's not just that. I'm not smart enough to be interesting. You're so smart. I can't do brain surgery. I've never flown a plane. <laughs> I'm not the president. No one on the Supreme Court is me. I'm not good enough for anything. In The Matrix, Neo's victory comes not in physically beating Agent Smith or even beating the system, because he doesn't actually at the end of that movie, or any of The Matrix movies technically, but his victory comes when he declares his name, freeing himself from how the system and Agent Smith specifically were trying to define him as Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson? My name is Neo. Here, Neo is self-actualizing and defining his own identity for himself outside of what the system tells him to be. And Barbie never gets that. She never gets to exist or find her self-worth outside of being a woman who lives in a commodified society, human or plastic. Her character arc points to an idea of the difficulties as a woman to make yourself a subject and not an object, but the narrative ultimately still defines her first and foremost by her plastic and, after the end choice she makes, her flesh and body. It's why white feminists so often reinforce systems of cisnormativity and white supremacy. White suffragettes, for example, were often wielded by white supremacists in America to frame their right to vote as under attack by black men and women's rights to vote or own land. And why TERFs today are often white feminists who have centralized their identity in their victimhood as women through how their reproductive rights are controlled and how women are just seen as baby-making factories. No, I Even want men out of women's spaces. That's not born different, that's a biological fact. And that biological fact determines whether or not somebody is a risk to women. Uh, this, this might come off crass, but there's some schools of thoughts that would posit that one of the biggest crimes that were committed is 
this framing of white womanhood as a marginalized experience. I I will pa- I will caveat that with I do believe that women in general, women and femmes, if you are femme presenting, you are going to experience misogyny and you will um in that case therefore engage in a marginalized experience. I think that what that like this idea that this white woman being a, a marginalized experience is a lie is because of the role that the white woman has played in a white a uh, supremacist society. Yeah, and upholding that. Right. And and the white woman's role in particular, women's suffrage um movements in particular like how uh Carrie Chapman was one of the people that was lionized, extolled, um spearheaded uh the women's suffrage movement, but literally at the 11th hour in negotiating with their abusers and their oppressors, white men, um they were just like enfranchise us the white women don't worry about the negroes they could still be subjugated would hate to throw the baby out with the bathwater but i think that's very telling about the 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 doctrine of white feminism is just like when you miss out the intersectional aspect of it when you don't include all of the different influences of perspectives that come when you bring a black woman or femme um into the room a trans woman a cis mm-hmm. woman all of these different perspectives in there they're going to influence and make up for those blind spots and that's what you don't get with a bobby and thus attack trans women who are seen as a threat to that self identity and patriarchal versions of womanhood through their vaginas and ability to reproduce because we don't have that at least in the way that they do this is why you'll often see turfs or anti-trans folks describe the genitals of trans women who get vaginoplasties like myself as having inverted or mutilated penises not only is this language meant to dehumanize our bodies as deformed, perverted, or inherently sexual, but it also only views genitals as able to exist within the white ideal binary cis endosexual versions of penis and vagina. Thus, a neo vagina, what trans women who get vaginas call our vaginas, or intersex folks genitals aren't seen as quote unquote real genitals, but variations upon the cisgender endosexual norm. Again, it showcases a lack of ability to envision bodies outside of a binary. This all goes to how white womanhood is often framed against blackness and queerness and transness. Because to contrast against colonial identities is the only way that white womanhood exists when it is stripped of an identity centered in victimhood. I'm pausing because I want to be clear with what I'm discussing for this section. People can totally find empowerment and identity in the concept of womanhood. I'm specifically talking about whiteness as it relates to womanhood. How many white women of economic privilege cannot find identity in womanhood outside of victimhood or in contrast to queer, trans, or BIPOC folks because they have no sense of how to reclaim womanhood outside of those concepts because it has specifically been stripped from them. Something the Barbie movie will attempt to wrestle with, but ultimately fails to truly move beyond, as we're going to discuss. Sadly, then, Barbie leans into this exact reading, albeit unintentionally, at the film's end. Barbie meets with the movie's version of the Matrix Oracle a second time, now revealed to be Barbie's creator, Ruth Handler, who based Barbie off of her own daughter. Ruth reinforces her in women's role as mother and Barbie's role as daughter. We mothers stand still, so our daughters can look back to see how far they've come. But why? Why are mothers meant to give up their identity to their children? The film seems unwilling to view women, and especially mothers, as anything beyond their roles, their labor they perform. The handling of this with Ruth Handler is particularly sad. Ruth Handler is a complex figure. She was seen as a woman icon given she was one of the few women leading businesses as the CEO of a major corporation, yet she was also behind the push to turn many feminist ideals into ways to monetize Barbie's selfhood. She was also involved in a financial scandal at Mattel involving evading taxes, yet she argued that this happened behind her back while she was fighting breast cancer and had a double mastectomy and thus, quote, never able to grab hold of things at Mattel and regain control, eventually leading her to resign from the company. This is something only offhandedly joked about in the film that seems to place the blame on Ruth herself instead of her actual claim that it happened behind her back. Baby, I am Mattel until the IRS got to me, but that's another movie. However, her experiences as a survivor led her down a new path. She started Nearly Me after struggling to find quality breast prostheses for herself, deciding that she would do it if no one else would, and dedicated much of the rest of her life to that cause. She has helped thousands of women and was given the Volunteer Achievement Award by the American Cancer Society. 
Interestingly though, her cancer work was through helping women be less ostracized and dehumanized and finding a sense of identity in having breasts, adding more complication to the dehumanization of women through beauty norms that we discussed earlier. The film condenses this entire history to single one-off jokes that uncomfortably lean into Jewish stereotypes while only framing Ruth as a mother. Ruth was Jewish, and while the film did a good job in having Rhea Perlman, a Jewish actress, play her, my friend of the channel and Jewish media critic Lady Knight the Brave pointed out that some of the choices with her lines, with the consistent jokes about tax evasion and other elements, were uncomfortable to her due to that context. With the additional very odd choice to have Will Ferrell CEO for no reason given the scene say, Some of my best friends are Jewish. And then in the following line make an odd reference to the term Jezebel, Get in the box, you Jezebel! This is even more uncomfortable. While Noah Baumbach, who worked on the script with his partner Greta Gerwig, is Jewish, Gerwig herself has repeatedly stated the film was primarily influenced by her Catholic upbringing. It is interesting too that Barbie visually compares Ruth to the Oracle and the Matrix, given that it's revealed that she was a co-creator of the Matrix in those films. Yet the Oracle works to try to create something new, seeing her system as flawed, whereas Ruth never works to change that system, only humanizes stereotypical Barbie while simultaneously claiming her as an extension of her own lineage. Beyond that, Ruth offers Barbie the chance to stop being an idea and become a human, aging and mortal. I want to be a part of the people that make meaning, not the thing that's made. This choice she's presented, while humanizing to stereotypical Barbie, is presented as one that she must make alone. No other Barbie is offered this choice. And thus, stereotypical Barbie leaves what she has known and joins a patriarchal system. Only stereotypical white Barbie gets the choice to be able to be humanized. In The Matrix, when Neo chooses to leave it, he's given a chance to form a community with others seen as equal to him. Indeed, The Matrix Resurrections makes clear that Neo's ability as the One, which supposedly makes him unique in the other three films, is not from his power alone. It is the power generated in his bond with Trinity, his love for someone else and his community. It was never just you. Alone, neither of you is of any particular value. Like acids and bases, you're dangerous when mixed together. He is actually not special or unique in and of himself, but gains power and uniqueness through community, one to which he can grow and give more power to others through. Barbie is denied this. Barbie is seen as important only on her own ability alone, and she cannot give this self-actualization to other members of her Barbie community. Because the film is trying to use her as a symbol for all womanhood, when in actuality she cannot be that. So the film is trying to have its cake and eat it too by humanizing Barbie to represent all women being humanized, as we can clearly see by the montage of images of many different women that the film shows as Barbie chooses to become human, yet still using that to symbolize women being an idea that we can then humanize conceptually to sell as a product. She is then allowed to live with Gloria and her daughter, but she's still living within a system that expressly dehumanizes her, just as Ken is forced to live in a society that dehumanizes him, something that Neo and Trinity expressly state at the end of Matrix Resurrections is their goal to break down, in a line that is very queer-coded. We were on our way to remake your world. Change a few things. I kinda like the paint the sky with rainbows idea. Just remind people what a free mind can do. I forgot, it's easy to forget. He makes it easy. Glad he does. This also reflects how the humanization of Barbie was actually something done by Ruth Handler back during their original ads for Barbie, not to empower women or Barbie herself, but to sell them as a product to make more money for Mattel. In the commercial, the little girl in the song says, I'll make believe that I'm just like you. So the doll is actually made human in this commercial, and in a way that girls totally relate. Beautiful Barbie. The buyers thought this wouldn't work, the little girls voted otherwise, and Barbie just exploded. Over 300,000 are sold in the first year, more than any other toy in history. The humanization of Barbie is to venerate capitalistic goals, not to earnestly empower her. 
This is the frustration seen when we view stereotypical Barbie as an idea versus Barbie as a character meant to represent a person. These stories, like Barbie or Star Wars, create archetypes of concepts that are played by people. Thus, these people become metaphors rather than actual human beings. And we ultimately, as the audience, watch these stories to see the humanity within these fictions, but don't actually feel it with these characters. If I'm allowed to be nerdy for a second, look at a comparison between the show Star Wars Andor versus Star Wars Ahsoka. Star Wars Ahsoka feels cold, distant, and more interested in the show's high-minded concepts with its characters instead of the people that are actually living within these systems. Whereas Andor as a show, I think, resonated critically because it feels like it's real people reacting to the systems that they live within. Stories of human beings living with these systems and fighting back against them, rather than individuals being representative of the systems themselves or aspects of it. It is why stereotypical Barbie feels so distant from us as an audience to identify into, because Barbie represents a version of womanhood that meant to represent all of women, rather than a singular woman in and of herself, and one that eventually only exists as a version of womanhood that can only exist within a system meant to generate the image of that woman to keep them constantly in battle with those around them, rather than a type of woman that could ever actually exist. Ultimately, it is so clear that Ken is the movie's primary focus. He gets the bigger character arc, hell, he even gets the big musical number. He feels like an actual character more so than stereotypical Barbie. The movie supposedly about women is more interested in humanizing Ken. While its message of patriarchy also hurts men is worthwhile, the fact that it can't give this same humanization to women generally, even white women, underscores how Barbie the movie isn't interested in breaking down the status quo of seeing women as secondary objects, but actively supports it. Finally, it's how the film highlights Barbie achieving humanity that rubs me ultimately in the worst way. Barbie is shown to be a real girl because she has a vagina. I'm here to see my gynecologist. Her self-actualization as a human woman is found through getting genitalia. It reminds me of the Black Mirror episode. It says Callister, yeah. Yes, yes. Because in that episode, they do a similar thing where they don't have genitals, but it's the literal CEO of a company doing that to them, to then be able to exploit them as his own little toys. Yeah. Um, and But they feel frustrated and not be able to have like any sense of like identity. Mm -hmm. Like theoretically, they could just like have a party while the, he's gone, but mm -hmm. they don't because he, they literally have like no way to exert any sense of self identity. We have tried grinding our mounds together out of sheer boredom. <laughs> no sensation at all. Can't even shit. Can't even have the basic fucking pleasure of pushing out a shit. Oh, I miss taking shit. Like all the Barbies and the Kens are pretty much living in that exact same world as USS Callister. CEOs controlling them and using them as toys, and yet they don't feel any of that frustration. Mm -hmm. And it goes to like at the part about them not being real people, even within the fiction of the story. And Barbie's journey to like self actualize as a person at the end, but then her personhood only being a desire to exist within like a patriarchy rather mm -hmm. than like something like USS Callister, which does at least have a little bit more of a radical edge of like they get to go and live in the JJ Abrams verse, yeah. which is like framed, framed at least as like yeah. something radically new. To any trans woman like myself who has heard rhetoric from TERFs that you need a real vagina to be a real woman, this was a really rough note for the movie to end on. I would never take away a woman's ability to find ownership over her reproductive system and her body, especially in a society that takes away agency from them by controlling those things. But it's the underscoring of womanhood as being actualized through having a vagina, even as a joke, that just reads as reinforcing this idea of womanhood being found in the ways a patriarchal system tries to dehumanize women by controlling her reproduction and using her as a breeding machine. It reinforces that idea of white supremacy. When I first saw the gynecologist's moment, the reason why I didn't immediately go to like the turf perspective mm -hmm. is because I had just read something about someone who was intersex, who didn't have a vaginal opening, mm -hmm. kind of like a Barbie. Yeah. And so part of them going to gynecologist for the first time was getting the surgery to correct that. And yeah. I thought, oh, for someone who is intersex and can relate to that kind of like not having a clear delineation of like that part of themselves, they will see that differently than me as a cis person or as a trans person. That's what's interesting is that womanhood is evolving. What, what genitals mean to people is evolving. And we can have that conversation. Reason that that rubbed me the wrong way is because my perspective was not given explicit voice anywhere else, even when there is literally a trans Barbie there. 
it, it was just trying to have Barbie, stereotypical Barbie, be womanhood for all women. And therefore, it has to filter the conversation, like, through, like, me having to interpret what that means when it's from that perspective. As opposed to, like, if you give voice to these other perspectives within the film, it would have been a better way to, like, me being like, yeah, that's a fine, because it's speaking from her perspective, not all womanhood perspective that the movie is trying to, like, hoist upon stereotypical Barbie. When placed in the context of the entire film, it feels like the writers were shockingly oblivious of what they were saying about trans people and gender generally. In one scene, stereotypical Barbie is catcalled by construction workers, and she responds by stating that she does not have a vagina and that Ken does not have a dick. And those catcalling creeps weirdly accept this completely. I do not have a vagina. And he does not have a penis. We don't have genitals. That's okay. Yeah, yeah whatever. It's, it's cool. yeah. This is my co-writer Aranok speaking through me here, but it kind of speaks for both of us because as trans women, we can both tell you very confidently that doing that would at best get you slurs, and at worst, well, let's just say that I, meaning Aranok, had people try to run me over with a truck. If either Aranok or I responded to men who catcalled us with that, we would be risking immediate and extreme violence. The Barbie film actively treats transphobia as a non-existent issue while ending on a transphobic note. While I get that the writers were likely trying to use a symbol for a common experience for many women that had probably not intended this reading, it, like so many other elements of this film, stumbles into bigotry through its staggering ignorance, and framing white cis womanhood as the only way we can view womanhood through. It goes back to that first overt Matrix scene, how Margot Robbie's stereotypical Barbie at first turns down the symbolic red pill. It's because Barbie wants to stay in that place of privilege. She wants to remain within her system and only is forced to confront its problems when she in any way has to face how she has been commodified or fails to live up to the stereotypical role upper middle class cisgender straight white women are allowed to live within. I know I'm stereotypical Barbie and therefore don't form conjectures concerning the causality of adjacent unfolding events, but some things have been happening that might be related. Only then is she willing to leave this luxury, and even then, she rarely stands in solidarity with those who are facing other problems beyond her limited perspective, while asking them to stand in solidarity with her, ultimately just reinforcing a world where she lives at the top, only choosing to leave it because she wants to be humanized, not because she seeks to humanize others and create a more egalitarian world for everyone else. In many ways, this is all Barbie ever could have been. It's a product made to sell more products, something that numerous of my peers here on YouTube have pointed out. So the question ultimately becomes, why do I and others critique the film this way? Why do we tear down something that became so meaningful to some people in a way that holds it up to a standard that it never could have reached given its limitations? And the answer is, because we need to be able to articulate those limitations in order to move beyond them. To be fair, Barbie should be commended for being able to say as much as it did overtly. Part of the reason The Matrix or other works that have incredibly revolutionary ultimate statements that are made by giant studios like Star Wars and or are capable of being so overtly radical is that they are shrouded in some layer of allegory that allows the artist plausible deniability in explaining to executives what the films actually mean, but also allow the works to be misinterpreted, dismissed, or intentionally perverted for darker ends, like the alt-right did by taking the red pill metaphor for themselves. Barbie, instead, is being directly overt, and did the most with what it could as a blockbuster film meant to sell a famous doll representing a symbol of femininity rooted in whiteness, colonialization, and capital. But ultimately, if you don't make the conversation about these limitations and problems of the film, the only conversation that we get to take away from it is either upholding white femininity or pushing back against sexist assholes, which allows them to control the narrative and conversation around the movie, rather than it being something that we all are able to talk about and move beyond. I like hearing from people who dislike the movie more than I did. I like hearing from people who like the movie more than I did, because I think that film criticism is not about objective correctness. Mm -hmm. It is about how we're using this to build conversation about how we view film yeah. and how we view gender. It's nice to have some good food to argue about <laughs> instead of exactly. arguing about fucking Wonder Woman, you know, like oh, garbage. God. Yeah. And I think that the online culture that we uh, live in has made it even harder because instead of arguing with each other in community, we're always arguing with people that we don't fucking care about. I don't care what racists think about 
the marvels like yeah. i really don't care but that's why that's why that's why fascism comes up because we make it about like the only thing we can talk about is the fascist assholes and because of that they get like they get their hooks in the conversation because that's all we can that's the only thing we have to talk about because there's nothing else to because everything else is so shallow if i'm being entirely honest there is a part of me that is scared to critique Barbie because people are so defensive of it and trans women so vilified right now in our society. I see this video right now that I'm making as quickly taken by many as a trans woman just trying to take something from cis women or trying to ruin something or being overly sensitive or being a woke scold. And that may seem like a trivial fear to some of you, but it's really not. Trans people generally, and trans women and non-binary folks especially, have a long history of being attacked because we directly point out how the binary dichotomy that we exist within is not only bullshit, but the desire to exist within a power hierarchy based on that dichotomy is not the end goal for any of us. We rupture that concept because non-binary people, trans men and trans women, specifically choose to work against or ignore the incentive for power through gendered means. But by doing so, we often get attacked even by those who are supposed to be supportive of us because we are attacking the status quo that lets them live in luxury. I have seen numerous times over the past year when I personally have spoken up about issues related to popular works of art, Hogwarts Legacy, I'm looking at you, as well as speaking up for racial issues, has led me to be vilified. Even by other trans women, especially trans women of certain privileges, as the enemy. And I'm not alone as a trans woman in feeling that way. But the reason that I and numerous others are offering this critique is not to vilify the film or those who made it, but to highlight several things. First, Barbie is capable of articulating a problem, but not a way forward, because it centralizes a white perspective. Greta Gerwig's filmography has long had this issue, with works like Lady Bird and Little Women, two great films that were hailed as 21st century feminist masterpieces, but which failed to present any intersectional look at their messages for women. And it's not that these films necessarily had to, especially considering that these films were very personal ones for Greta Gerwig, but when you have the entire film industry hailing them as feminist works of art, it is worth questioning why a film deemed progressive is often only progressive in terms of its discussion of womanhood to an extent, but rarely in its discussion of racial, sexuality, or even transgender perspectives that intersect with them. This is not an issue exclusive to Gerwig, nor the film industry as a whole, but our society is trying to filter all these conversations through a white supremacist lens that views things in binary. This brings me to the second thing to highlight, how framing the movie this way as being only able to talk about one issue to the exclusion of all else while still presenting the myth of neutrality of experience beyond that, or just using otherization as a foil for our centralized protagonist, allows us to see all of these issues as separate. It allows the mainstream conversation to see things like race and gender and trans and queer issues as all distinct fights, which makes it so easily to isolate us from each other and fuel a binary us versus them mentality that feeds an endless cycle of anger and violence that doesn't allow us to see something more extraordinary the clouds above the machine city. Beautiful. The Matrix, to be fair, also has problems. Both The Matrix and Barbie center the narrative of white people having to learn that while the system benefits them most directly, that they are still commodified and ultimately dehumanized by them. This is why, while I adore the Matrix movies, Sense8 is actually my favorite Wachowski project because it centralizes multiple perspectives who each have their own individual culture, identity, and context through which they are able to find connections to others through. That being said, Sense8 is also still not without its flaws. Indeed, the Matrix movies and the Wachowski sisters generally have many problems with how they utilize the narratives of racialized people in their works. See The Matrix is Intrinsically Trans by my co-writer Aronok for more on that. But Barbie places this inability to see oppression as a natural state for everyone except women. In contrast, The Matrix at least hints at how racialized people already exist with that understanding from a young age, and it's only the most privileged and unracialized that can genuinely remain intentionally oblivious to the artificiality of these systems built upon intersecting hierarchies while simultaneously upholding it themselves. And I already know the response in the comment sections are ultimately going to be, why must Gerwig and Barbie address all these issues? Why is this placed on her? And you're right. It's unfair to demand that Gerwig go beyond her perspective when we don't ask the same for men in her position. She's allowed to tell her story, and she has done it in films like Lady Bird. 
My issue with her earlier work is not with Gerwig, but how Hollywood would venerate these films as feminist while never allowing other stories the same, nor let them reach the same level of notoriety as her work. And when they do reach that level, they are considered black films or queer films, siloed into marketing buckets that belittles them and limits their reach when true progressiveness is about understanding the complex humanity of us all. On top of this, it's clear Gerwig is attempting to position herself as a studio director. Her team stated that she didn't want to be seen as the biggest woman director or a big director, but specifically as a big studio director. She wants to focus on making herself more marketable and be able to speak to more people with her art. And so if that's the position that she wants to be in, then I have to ask, why is that your goal? Is it to create art that genuinely tries to meaningfully speak to how our world needs to change to as broad an audience as possible? Or are you just doing what Barbie does in the film? humanizing yourself for your own gain while not doing the same for other voices while thinking that you are by tokenistic representation. Is Barbie as a film meant to uplift women? Or sell the idea of Gerwig's seeming individual uniqueness using the pink paint of feminism to do so? Is Gerwig trying to make herself an idea, not a human, in order to sell her own success? I wish that we were able to not make whether or not you like Barbie or can escape into Barbie, the ultimate parameter of like how you express feminism. But that ultimately becomes how all these movies get marketed. It's like, are you a good woman if you don't like blah, blah, blah? If you like the Marvels, are you a good woman? If you don't like it, are you a good woman? And it becomes rather than a space to have actual criticism, a way for us to now engage in like battling misogyny. Who's the real misogynist now, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, guys, the movie made a billion dollars. If I was being generous, I would say Barbie as a movie became so precious to many women, even beyond white women, because many of us, myself included, are so starved for anything that gives us a voice in a mainstream work of art that cuts across our entire culture that we can all just share. For a moment, Barbie allowed all of us to feel seen, at least in a nominal way, when often we are so stuck with these shallow representations of womanhood like Captain Marvel or Rey, who remain stoic or distant, having to be these blank slates that don't speak to the actual experiences of us. So when Barbie comes along, it feels like a breath of fresh air because it does the bare minimum of saying a woman's experience is more than just having a body with boobs. A breath of fresh air that people want to cling to in hopes of not suffocating it. But in truth, we all, every one of us, men included, deserve better. Deserve to have something that actually sees beyond product and exploitation. Deserves to actually breathe. As the Matrix movies show, it is possible to make big budget films that move beyond individual veneration. Or you can look at things like Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse or Star Wars Andor as recent examples as well. Or I could present you with the movie Bottoms that came out just this year that discusses intersecting issues of sexuality, gender, and womanhood while being absolutely hysterical. It can be done. Barbie isn't devoid of worth. A lot of men found value in the conversations about Ken and how patriarchal views on manhood are not great for them and that they feel not enough and struggle to construct a sense of self outside of objects and significant others. This is Aronox speaking through Jesse again for a moment, but discussing the film with my mom, she said that she really valued the film treating stereotypically feminine things as something desirable, positive, and valuable. That having grown up being told anything that she liked was dumb, a waste of time, and being told that she couldn't enjoy something like Barbie because it was sexist, was really nice to be able to go and see this movie in a big theater. She really enjoyed the message that the world is sometimes a miserable place, so if something brings you happiness, hold on to it. She also really valued Weird Barbie in a way that resonated with her. My mom is a breast cancer survivor. And because the experience of chemo stripped a lot of her general social identifiers of femininity from her, especially her hair, and the ego death of that, and how it made her feel so alien, she felt seen by Weird Barbie. And I think that's particularly beautiful, especially in the context of Ruth Handler's life. I, again, Aronach, value the movie also because, despite having issues with it, I really connected with Weird Barbie as a trans lesbian, and because both my mother and I have found common ground in the experience of being stripped and denied aspects of our womanhood. That is incredibly valuable. We, and this includes me, Jesse, here again, all agree that the best scene in the film, the most valuable, is a very simple one the studio nearly cut, where Barbie sits crying at a bench and very earnestly compliments the beauty of an older woman. 
You're so beautiful. I know it. The film manages to say that aging as a woman is good. And that's a message lacking from a lot of media. Discussing our issues with the work does not remove these positive elements, just like how someone enjoying the film does not remove the issues. Multiple things can be true about a work at the same time, and ignoring marginalized perspectives because it's inconvenient to you is an issue both in the film and with people who want to enjoy it uncritically, as well as with our society generally. If I, back to Jesse again, am not being so generous though, I would say that the film was so popular because it didn't do anything to question anyone's view of the status quo. Gently selling them the veneer of feminism and the idea that it was actually radical, when in fact it was quite the opposite. It's not just capitalism bad, it's white supremacy bad in a deeply insidious way, in that it's made itself so invisible that even those who made the film seem to not understand the implications of what they were saying by exclusion, while at the same time, those who funded it certainly did. The film roots itself in the subjugation of women while exalting the commodification of white womanhood above all else. And all of this is hard because we don't have the same questions or demands of Greta Gerwig's or similar movie's counterparts when we should. It's an unfair standard, I know this. But the film asks us to engage with it, it wants us to critique it, and I think we owe it to it to ask, why is this the story Gerwig chose to tell and how she decided to tell it? She did her best, and the film was always limited in what it could say, but it's a film that deserves to be critiqued for its failures and how it sells a false catharsis that paves the way for all the wrong lessons to be learned on every level, both in Hollywood and how we talk about how to move beyond these systems of oppression. Ultimately, my frustration is not with Barbie, but how Barbie is a reflection of our current cultural conversation. How more and more people violently are clinging to the status quo because they're scared to lose it even as it crumbles around them. I've even seen the trans community fracture along these lines in the past year. So as most art ends up being, Barbie is but a representation of that. And I don't think there's an easy way to conclude this. All I can say is this. The Matrix ends with a monologue by Neo that he wishes to tear down the entire system as Rage Against the Machine plays. Barbie ends with Margot Robbie reinstating a system of oppression with just superficial improvements before leaving to join the Matrix itself. Given that, which story do you think is the one we need today? Alrighty, everybody, thank you so much for watching this video, and thank you to this video sponsor, Ground News. But beyond that, I do have one last announcement before you go, beyond the normal like, like, and subscribe, but don't forget to do that. This is not going to be my last video of 2023. I have one more extremely big video essay coming, and it is going to be a doozy, because it is going to have some things to say. It is going to be a video on the politics of Star Wars, but not really about Star Wars. So I wanted to give you all a brief look at it because we have been working on this video for over a year. So here's a quick look.
Yeah, Aranok has been killing it with the animation and we are so excited to bring this video to you. It is going to be huge and it's gonna come early next month. So please be on the lookout for it. And we would love your support if you're able to do so. Um, that being said, if you wanna get it early as well as get some cool behind the scenes tidbits before it comes out, as well as your name in the video itself, please consider going supporting us over on Patreon. These videos take a lot of work and a lot of time. Um, and I try to pay everyone that works on this, including Aranok and many others, yeah, fairly. And so if you can support me and help me pay my bills and their bills, it would be greatly appreciated. Also, like I mentioned, I am making a film called Identities that is going to be coming out early next year. I'll let you know the release date when I know it, but it is a super exciting film. Here's a quick little behind the scenes snippets that I can show you without spoiling too much, um, but it's gonna be very exciting. And you can find that over on Nebula, my streaming service that I made with a bunch of other creators. So subscribe to that to get the film and all of my other fellow creators work. But beyond all of that, thank you so much for watching and I hope you all, my friends, live long and prosper. Thank you so much, patrons. I could not do this without you. You literally make my entire life possible. So thank you so much for that. And I wanna give an extra special thank you to Carrie Ellen Foss, Joel Herman Holt, Nils Osborne, Odin's Home, Arkton Arklesser, Lily Gray, Heather Long, Barbie Ann Rounds, L. Tan Tivy, Sarah Montgomery, Jack McAllen, Stephen Kleinard, Hannah Friedrich, Courtney Ray Kelly, Jem Shin, Michael Woolnitz, Christian Hertz, I Yearn, Dark Arcon, Alex Miller, Randy Thompson, Matt Chung, Chloe Dollar, Chris Showers, Baba Ruski, Super Desi, Samuel Howard, Brits Creek, Smooky Heather Sylvia, Nissan Mayor, Chris Christine S, Tara Rose, Angela Hendricks, Vincent Ellington, Todd Verling, Lily Blainley, Joseph Dewey, Meadow Whisper, Alicia Stice, Joel Gilly, Felicia Tost, Marshall Nye, Sammy Joe Retro, James Krivda, Rose Connolly, Zane Schuchler, Dominic Noble, Onwe Eos, Jennifer Fuss, Weirdy Beardy, Ruth, Kaylee Lang, Sunk Corgi, Sean McKenzie, Nathan Froughton, Jolene Cassidy, Sonia Nero Perdo, Farangato, Quattro, Shield Maiden, 4444, Sasha M. Melody Ann, Winter's Good, Teresa, Rain Concorgan, Ryan Hunter, Lev Goodwin, Scott Russell, John with a B, Craig and David, Kayla Arula, Leah the Boyd, Damian Rice, The Mighty Jinjojo, W. Randy Edie, Teague Wilson, Melinda Walters, Jane Persuades, LK, Stephen Richardson, Kevin Frotag, Sean Piper, Goat Stefanson, Sean Sullivan, Flyan Katie, Beatrix Poovers, Matthew Craiglo, Epsilon is Greater Than, David Demma, Flynn, Mark H. Williams, Author, William Stewart, Pertree, Alicia Cromston, Sarah Leslie Hutchkins, Adam Smasher, Grumpy Dragon 75, Kay List, Sarah Boston, Blueberry Hill, Casual Observer, Laura Demero, Emma Ramirez, Jeffrey Day Thompson, Sky Skinner, Roy Negby, Sarah Lamaro, Katie Kay, Jason Knott, Jess Johnson, Rosalind Bennett, Burdix High, Kurt Mullen, Jordan Lessero, Blue. Bob's Saget, The Tipsy Changelings, Valerie Blackbird, Luna, Troy Stull, Joanne the Wretched Witch, Zophel, Celestial Dawn, Hope Jace Tuliana, Tori Pertz, Carolyn Clark, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Crit Fax, Devin Camerlocker, Carrie On, Lou Tostin, Michael Weber, Callum McLeod of Clan McLeod, It's a Bug, Not a Feature, and Abigail Marie. Thank you to all of you. I send you all the love. Mwah, and live long and prosper, you beautiful people.